Hello, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. It's just letting people in one at a time from the waiting room. And we'll start in a moment. All right, good morning, everybody. We have quite a lot to uh, get through today. We have a double parsha of Chukat and Balak. The Kliakar's commentary on Chukat is going to be slightly different from the Kliakar's commentary on Balak. Chukat as a parsha has quite a lot going on in it. Balak is really one storyline. What I'd like to achieve today is to look at one major concept of the Kliakar on Parshat Chukat, one major approach. Um, which we're going to see in his commentary this morning, together with a couple of small things. And then when it comes to Parshat Balak, what I'd like us to do is to achieve an overview of Parshat Balak, to understand the greater structure of Parshat Balak. And we're not going to look at all the details within that structure, but once we have the greater structure of Parshat Balak, it gives us an opportunity afterwards to go back and look at all the details and how everything falls in. But let's start with Parshat Chukat in source number one. And the Kliakar is going to be responding to one of the great ironies of the Para Aduma. As is known, as it says, Vaitalahem le Chukat Olam, this should be for you as an eternal statute. Umazem me hanidaycha bet begadav, and the one who sprinkles the purification water needs to wash his clothes. Vahanogea be me hanidah, the one who touches the purification water, yitma ada aref, will become tame until the evening. And on this point, the Kliakar is going to comment on the fact that many Mephashim have tried to explain this point at the beginning of source number two. And he says, Rav HaMefrashim Yatsu Delaket Velo Matsu Tam Masbik. Most of the Mephashim, or many Mephashim, have gone out to gather to try and explain what's going on this, and they have not found a good enough reason. Let's remind ourselves that in the Kliakar's introduction to his commentary on the Torah, he states his aims in writing this perush, and one of his aims was to say that lots of Mepharshim have explained lots of things. He viewed himself as being the ma'asef, the rear guard, the one who's coming at the end to make sense of everything which has been said already. And in the event that he feels the Mepharshim have gone out to explain something and they haven't sufficiently succeeded, then he comes at the end to try and explain what's really going on. And here he's going to be referring to the major question, How can the very same para aduma, which purifies the impure at the very same time, defile the pure? Because the one who activates the process, the one who purifies the one who is impure becomes impure in the process. How can we understand this great irony? And he's going to really enjoy explaining it to us. And he says, And now, Hat oznacha ushma, lend me your ear and pay attention. Ki matzinu shekol ochel eno letuma. We have another parallel example that no type of food is susceptible to becoming impure and shiyipal alav mayim until it has come into contact with water or one of the other fluids. As we can ask the same question again. When it comes to food, food can only become impure once it's come into contact with water first. But water itself comes from the greatest source of purity. The way we purify things is to immerse ourselves in water. So how can water, on the one hand, be a source of purity for us and come from the source of purity? And at the same time, water is what makes food susceptible to impurity. So he says we've got a parallel case. Aval bi'or ha'inyan kachwi says we have to explain as follows. Shekachu betiviyut. This is just part of nature. Shekol davar enomit pa'el ki im mehapcho. Things are only activated by their opposites. 
meaning you need an opposite force in order to bring something to life. And he's going to give examples. Something which is from the same category is not going to have the same impact. For example, Why does the Yetzirah attack the Jews more than attacks the other nations? And he goes on to say, Have the biggest Yetzirah don't think the fact that the Tamid Chachamim makes them immune to the Yetzirah. They've got the biggest Yetzirah. Because these are the opposites of the Yetzirah. And so the Yetzirah is going to put up a fight against the opposite. Al-Kain Hurot said it, Gaber Aleihem, therefore it wants to overcome them. And he gives another example. The strongest dark period of the night is just before sunrise. Why? Things are activated. Things are mitpael in modern Hebrew is to be excited, to be amazed, to be wowed. But let's use the word activated this morning. Things are activated, activated by the opposite forces. Lefichach, therefore, kol ochel v'zera when it comes to foodstuffs, enomit pa'el min hatuma lasod boroshem. It can only be activated and impacted by impurity. Ad sheavo alav mayim, once it's come into contact with water shekulam tahara, which are themselves fully pure. And once, let's take an apple. An apple has become immersed, has come into contact with water. The apple has come into some contact with something pure. Now that the apple has come into contact with something pure, that apple is susceptible to becoming impure. And along comes the impurity which wants to overcome the purity. And defeat it. And then it makes an impact. Now, you may have forgotten that we're talking about Parashat Chukat. So let's go back to Parashat Chukat and understand where all of this takes us. And he says, this is what's going on in the Parasha. And there may be scientists amongst us who may wish to unmute themselves and explain in modern science this theory as well, or in medicine, as we will see soon. Kach mei nida. So it is with the purification waters. Because these purification waters have two active ingredients. Sheesh behem mayim, they've got water, shekulam tahara, which is entirely pure. V'yesham efer para, and the other ingredient is the ash of the para aduma, shekula tuma, which is entirely impure. V'hem uravin yachad, and these two ingredients are mixed together. L'fichach, now we have these two active ingredients. Let's see the impact this I don't want to call it a potion, this mixture will have on different people. If this water is sprinkled on an impure person, then let's look at the two ingredients and how they react. As the ash of the para aduma isn't going to have a negative impact on the impure person because he's already impure. But the water inside that mixture will have an impact on him. Because those are the opposite of his current status. Because he's impure. And the water is pure. That's why the waters work upon him and they overcome the impurity. So this guy's impure. What's his medicine? His medicine is a mixture of water and the ashes of the para aduma. The ashes of the para aduma do not have a negative impact on this individual because they're from the same category. He's already impure, but it's the pure water, which is the opposite, which is the active ingredient in this case. However, the clear goes on and says, what happens if the very same potion comes in contact with somebody pure? It's not a potion. It's a mixture. Aval Adam Tahor, when it comes to a pure person, Hanoser Mehanida, who carries this purification water, those very same waters which purified the impure don't play an active role for somebody who's already pure. They're the same category as him. They're both pure. 
But the ash of the paraduma has a negative impact on that person, because that's the opposite of him. Because he's already pure. The ash is impure. That's why the ash of the paraduma, which doesn't have a negative impact on the tame person, does have a negative impact on the tahor person who needs to administer this medicine. So let's think of it as a medicine at the moment. You have a medicine, which is a cure for one person, but for the person who needs to administer the medicine, it is a poison. Because the active ingredient in the medicine, which purifies one person, is irrelevant to the one administering the medicine. And that which is dangerous to the one administering the medicine is not dangerous to the one who is already ill, because that person is already ill. Now, He's explained so far on a technical level the great irony of the para aduma, why the one who purifies become impure, because the agents we're using here is a mixture which has two active ingredients which respond in different ways to different people. Now you might come along and say as follows. Uh, is that a question? Is that a hand going up? Please do unmute yourself if your hand is up. Isn't this all based though on the premise that the afer of the para is a tame? I mean, why is it tame lachatchila? I think you're saying it represents tuma. The afer, it's dead, it's an animal, it's burnt, it's representing tuma. That's that's his premise. Mm -hmm. The afer okay. itself is something which represents impurity as opposed to water, which is a purification substance. Okay. But I understand how you can, if you want, argue on that premise of his. Thank you. But now he's going to ask as follows. He's going to say, if we have two ingredients, one which is the relevant ingredient for the one who's becoming purified and the irrelevant ingredient, why don't you only use the relevant ingredient? Meaning, if you've got somebody who's impure, just chuck water on them or throw them in water, let them immerse themselves in water, because that is the active ingredient. It is the water which is the active ingredient for the one who's doing tshuva. By the way, this is all going to take us somewhere. We're not just doing spiritual chemistry. The empty shalomar, if you want to ask as follows, why do I need the ash of the para uduma in this mixture? Just leave it out. Only use water. The answer is, you still need the ash to be part of this mixture. He can only purify himself if he's familiar with the source of his impurity. He needs to try to remove the reason. So the truth is that the ash of the para aduma also has an active role in his purification process, although it doesn't have a negative impact on the individual who is already impure. What is the point of all of this? Well, first of all, to understand what is going on, which is of inherent value. However, from this point, the Kliakam moves forwards to suggest how this is relevant to our lives. And what we're about to read in the Kliakar is better known in his name than his introduction, which we just read. So let's read what he says. When it comes to the world of remez, I reckon you can say, continuing in the theme which has been laid out for us by the Baal HaKedah, he explains in his book that this whole process of the para aduma can be explained as a remez, as a hint towards the world of tshuva. So we're now going to take the model we've just learned and the concept of the para aduma and to apply it to our everyday lives of tshuva. It's relevant to my life. None of you people need to do tshuva, but we all need, know people who need to do tshuva. So for people who need to do tshuva, how does the tshuva process work? And he says, continuing this theme, it makes sense to claim, spiritual healing is parallel to physical healing. He says you can have a, a substance, a liquid, which heals a sick person, but if a healthy person takes that medicine, it will make them unwell. That's not uh, crazy stuff. We all know that. That if a healthy person takes certain medicines, it's, it's damaging for them. Like our sages said in the Gemara in Yoma, 
Heichi dami bal tshuva. He says this is parallel to the definition of the ultimate bal tshuva. What is the ultimate bal tshuva? Kegon shabao tom aseli ado. If the very same opportunity to act comes to their hands, upiresh mimeno, and on the second time round you avoid the situation. And Rav Yehuda is about to give an example. Machver Rav Yehuda. Rav Yehuda fleshed this out with details, which means perek, if you find yourself in the same time frame and the same circumstances, uvo'oto isha, with the same woman you sinned with the first time. So let's say you have somebody who sinned with a woman, and you find yourself at the same stage of life. So you're not, you know. Um, 112 years older, so you don't have the same energies you once had, but you find yourself at the same stage of life with the very same woman of Otoma come in the very same place. Nobody will know the identical opportunity represents itself. And the last time you found this yourself in this situation, you sinned with that woman. And on this occasion, you did not sin with that woman. That is the ultimate Baal Tshuva, because the ultimate expression of Tshuva is having the same opportunity present itself, but not fall again the second time round. Because the location and the, cons- and the let's call it the context, that's where you have to express the very same might on the second time round to overcome your Yetzirah. Why? Because in that, it's actually a second time around, it's even harder because you've already tasted, let's call it the sweet taste of sin, and you want to make it a habit. So we're, we're throwing around different contexts here. We're going to have to make some seder, which we're about to do on page two. But what he's saying is the ultimate definition of tshuva is to find yourself in the same situation again, But when you find yourself in the very same situation with the very same temptation and you overcome the temptation, that is the ultimate Baal Tshuva. Now, how is that related to us now? Some people explain, this is what our sages meant. In the Gemara and Brachot, page 34b, when they said, this is another well-known phrase, in a place where Baalei Tshuva stand, absolute tzaddikim cannot stand there. Now, we generally explain this to mean that the madrega of the Baal Tshuva is higher than the madrega that a tzaddik gamor can reach. Somebody who's erred in their ways and overcome their challenges and temptations to do tshuva is on a higher level, the place where they stand, even a tzaddik gamor can't stand. But now, he's explaining it differently. And he says, no, 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 no. It means there's somewhere that a Baal Tshuva can stand, and a Tzadik Gamur can't stand there. What's that place? Let's, before we think, I want to just read what he says before we interpret what we think he's saying. What he's saying is as follows. A Baal Tshuva needs to stand in the place where he originally stood. And to have Yichud, to be in seclusion, with the very same woman that he sinned with, that's what he needs to do as part of his tshuva process. That's where a Baal Tshuva stands. But a Tzadik Gamor, that Yichud, that seclusion, is forbidden. Because he's not allowed to bring himself to that temptation. Nimtza, what do you find? And now it'll all come together. Sheyichud, we have this seclusion, this place of temptation for sin. Dehainu etzem ha which is the very function of tshuva for one person. Metameh ha-tehorim, umetaher hatmeim. This yichud can be for someone who is pure, something which makes them impure, but for someone who's impure, it makes them pure. Just like the um, impact of water on food, or just like the impact of the mixture of the para aduma, you can have something which is a medicine for one person and poison for another person. And the Kliakar has taken us in the direction of saying that seclusion in a place of temptation, of sin, for one man is their chuvah, and for another man is their downfall. 
That is what he says. Now, if you want, you can now play the game of what did he mean to say? But in terms of what he says, he very clearly says that a Baal Tshuva needs to be in that position in order to perform Tshuva, which leads to the question, does that mean that if you've sinned once, you should go out of your way to find that opportunity again to prove that you're not going to sin again? Which for many of us would be uh, counterintuitive. And also, normally when we teach this idea, if it appears, whether it's in the Gemara or the Rambam, whatever source we use for this concept, we usually immediately throw in a phrase and we say, of course, it doesn't mean that you intentionally have to put yourself in that position. But it appears in the Kliyakar that that's what he's saying. It appears in the Pshat of the Kliyakar is that he is saying that a Baal Tshuva needs to put themselves in a place of temptation in order to prove that they're not that kind of person anymore. Is that what he means? I don't know. Maybe he wants us to be aware and assumes we're aware that obviously he doesn't mean that somebody who's had problems going to brothels, that his tshuva is to go to a brothel. Obviously, you shouldn't do that. Um, maybe he thinks it should be obvious to us. The problem is that whatever, let's call it apologetic explanation you want to give of his words, you're going to have to somehow squeeze into his words, and that's going to be the challenge. And as a result, there are people who quote this Kliyakar literally and attack the Kliyakar for what he says in this week's parasha, because they say it cannot possibly be that you need to go and put yourself in that place of temptation. Um, that cannot possibly be the case. And what it means is you have to be the kind of person who... If you were in that position, then you would do the right thing. It doesn't mean you have to create that situation. But if you were, and also there is a woman here who's a human being with their own feelings, and she's also part of the story. But it doesn't mean you have to create the situation. But in the event that the situation was to present itself, you have to be strong enough to overcome that situation. Either way, those are the Kliyakar's controversial words in this week's parasha. If you want them to be controversial, if you don't want them to be controversial, you can say he didn't mean exactly what he wrote. And he goes on to say, why does the Baal Tshuva need to behave in a way which is different to a tzaddik? He says, a Baal Tshuva needs to go to the other extreme of that which he sinned with, which seems to suggest he shouldn't be going down the same old path. In order to reach the average place. Like the artisans, if you want to straighten out a piece of wood which has become crooked, you need to bend it the other way. So a crooked piece of wood needs to be bent in order to become straight again. A tzaddik gamor shouldn't behave in that behavior. You shouldn't go around bending a tzaddik gamor if it's already on the straight and narrow. should just stay on the middle path. Don't be too righteous and don't be too wicked. Be a good average person. If you want to be Hasidic and call that a Benoni, you can have that discussion. And he says that this concept of avoiding the extremes is represented as well in the ingredients of our mixture here. Some people say, what do we put into this mixture? Cedar, wood, and hyssop. Those are the two extremes. The great mighty cedar on the one hand and the, and the humble lowly hyssop on the other. Don't be as, uh, as tall as a cedar. And don't be too, too lowly either. Just uh, stay in the middle, in safe territory. That is why, and therefore, this mixture of the para both defiles and purifies. What's the lesson here? When it comes to tshuva, there are certain activities which for some will make them pure, and for others, the very same activity can make them impure. It all depends on the mekabel, the recipient, the individual involved. 
וזה דרך נכון וברור, he says it is correct and it is clear. Well, if he says it's correct and it is clear, then it is correct and it is clear. Let's move on to a couple of small things from Parashat Chukat and then Balak. Source number three. ויבואו בני ישראל כל העדה מתברצין בחודש הראשון, we came along to מתברצין in the first month. וישב העם בקדש, we sat in קדש, ותעמוד שם מרים ותקבה שם. מרים passed away there, and she was buried there. And what do we read straight away? ולא היה מים לעדה, there was no water for the assembly. ויקלו על משה ועל ארון, we gather against משה and ארון, and we have the whole story there by getting water out of the rock, which we know too well. But let's just look at the background to this story. According to the Kliyakar, where did this all start? There was no water for the assembly. We were punished by not having water. What was the punishment for? We did not properly eulogize Miriam. Meaning, when Miriam passed away, we didn't properly acknowledge or mourn her loss. Kiv Moshe Ba'aron, when it came along to her brothers, and the MR for each of them, it says, Vayavkuotam B'nei Israel, they passed away, and everyone cried. V'chan, here, lo ne'mar Vayavkuotam, it doesn't say that we cried the loss of Miriam. V'ne'mar, what does it say, as we saw? It just says, V'tamotcham V'tikabesham. She died, she was buried, and the story moves on. We didn't mourn her, we didn't eulogize her, it wasn't such a big loss for us. The place where she died, where she died, that's where she was buried. straight away. And she was just forgotten as a dead person from the heart. We just moved on. We didn't properly acknowledge or feel that which she was now missing for us. Okay, therefore, our water was removed from us. So now we would understand retroactively, we understand that all along, why did we have this well? It was in Miriam's schut, um, in Miriam's merit. What does this mean? If I'm going to be a little bit liberal now with my uh, explanation of this, maybe you can take this to mean that the Kliakar is saying, that had we acknowledged Miriam's contribution, the same way we had acknowledged the contribution of the men, of her brothers, then maybe we wouldn't have had this whole issue of being punished without water. Maybe Moshe could have brought us into the land of Israel. Maybe everything would have been much better. It all came from not um, recognizing the contribution of women. Now that's already expanding this concept a bit further, and it's convenient and modern to explain that. What the Kliakar is saying is this is about woman, not necessarily woman, but certainly when it comes to Miriam herself, this whole episode began with us not properly acknowledging the loss of Miriam and not understanding that which she had given us in our lifetime. And when she did pass away, when we lost her, the water, then we really understood, wow, in Miriam's lifetime, we really did gain significantly from her. The final thing on the topic of water and wells, we have the song of the well at the, towards the end of Parashat Chukat in source number five. As Yashir Yisrael at Ashira Hazot, then Yisrael will sing this song, Ali ve'er enula, arise a well, responds to it. And this beautiful song of the well has one obvious missing ingredient. Well, two, one of them is Miriam. That's not the one we're talking about now because she's no longer with us. But when I was, if I would say to you, finish the sentence, as Yashir, you would say, Moshe uvene Yisrael et Ashira Hazot. But now we're 40 years later, what's the wording? As Yashir Yisrael et Ashira Hazot, Moshe is missing from this song. And I mentioned this on a Thursday night she or a couple of weeks ago. In the next Pasuk, Be'er as well, Chafaru Sarim was dug by officers, Karua Nidivei Am, the noble ones excavated it, Bim Chokek B'mishanotam, with a lawgiver and their stick. So the Mechokek is a reference to Moshe, he's the lawgiver. Matana, and a gift from the Midbar, and then the song goes on. The Kliya Khan notes in source number six. As Yashir Yisrael et Ashira Hazot, Ma'cha Shalon Emar, as Yashir Moshe of an Israel, from the fact that it doesn't explicitly mention Moshe like we're used to with this kind of wording, but furthermore, 
שלא שרו שירה הזאת בתחילת ארבעים. We didn't sing the song at the beginning of our time in the wilderness, only now are we singing a song for the well. שמע מינה על הצלן פעם היה, שבני ישראל אמרו שירה זו על משה. This song was sung uh, in respect of משה. שחזרה הבאר בזכותו, אחר שפסקה במיטת מרים, because now we have a well again in Moshe's merit, because the well is no longer in Miriam's merit, M- Miriam's no longer with us, so now we have a well in Moshe's merit, so we sing a song in his honor about the well, so Moshe can't lead us in song in his own honor. That's why Miriam isn't mentioned in this song, because the well isn't in her honor anymore. When Iskara Moshe and Moshe is mentioned, although in passing, Shneemarza says, Be'er chafaru asarim karu anadivei am bimachokek, that we refer to a lawgiver. Ve'ein mechokek ela Moshe, the lawgiver is Moshe. Uveta'anit, and the Gemara in Tanit tells us, Masik shechazra bizchut Moshe, the well returned in Moshe's schut. And it's just a nice element that we often reflect on the tragedy of Parsha Chukat, of Moshe hitting the rock and not speaking the rock and whatever happened with the rock and not being able to enter the land. What we see is that we sing a nice song for Moshe, for the water which we receive from a well in his merit. There is a, there's a nice element in this parasha as well, according to the Kliyakar's reading. Let's leave behind Parashat Chukat and now move on to Parashat Balak. Parashat Balak is an interesting parasha um, because the things we're going to read about now, B'nai Yisrael in the Midbar had no idea about. The entire story of the major part of this week's parasha, with Balak and Bilam and the attempts to curse us and how the curses are turned into beautiful words and the whole story of the donkey and all of this, when we are actually living in the Midbar at the time, we are completely oblivious. Our only contribution to this week's parasha is after Hashem having miraculously and beautifully and poetically saved us in this week's parasha, at the end of the parasha, we get a role, we sin with the daughters of Moab. So so that's our contribution to the parasha. And our parasha can almost make us think, um, how many times has Hashem saved us that we have absolutely no idea about? And how many attempts have there been to curse us and destroy us and the success is that we don't even know that those attempts existed. We might be walking along completely oblivious to the things that Hashem is doing for us. But that's the major part of this week's parasha. And when you read through the parasha, it may feel a little difficult to understand the different stages of the parasha, especially when it comes to the brachot and the poetic languages. What's the difference between this place and that place, this bracha and that bracha? So what the Kliyaka is going to provide us with this morning is a structure for the parasha, to understand the meaning of the different attempts and the different locations. So we've got here in sources seven, eight, and nine are the three attempts to curse us. Attempt number one in source seven, Vayhiva Voke was in the morning, Vayikach Balak et Bilam, Balak took Bilam, Vayalehu Bamot Baal, and he took him up to Bamot Baal, Vayar Misham Ketzeha'am, so the location for the first attempt to curse us, which as we know turned into blessing, was on this place where they could see Ketzei Ha'am, the edge of the people, the outskirts of the people. And it fails. Now we have attempt number two in source eight. Vayoma elav barak, Balak says to him, let's try from somewhere else. Maybe somewhere else will have a better vantage point for you to curse this people. Let's look at them from there. Efes, however, katsehu tir'e, you're going to see the age of the people, the chulo lo tir'e, but you won't see the whole people, the kavno li misham, and curse it for me from there. Now, if in source number seven, for attempt number one, it says he saw the edge of the people, and then for attempt number two, he says, let's go for a plan B. Let's try somewhere else. Let's go somewhere we can say the edge of the people, but not the whole people. It suggests that in attempt one, they saw the edge of the people and the whole people. Because here it's Ketseha and the edge of the people. And attempt number two, it's the edge, but not all of it. Suggesting that perhaps earlier they did see all of it. I'll explain all of this soon. But that failed as well. 
So then he went for source attempt number three. And what happens in attempt number three? A nav bilam lifts up his eyes. He sees us dwelling according to our camps. And Hashem's spirit was upon us, upon him. And then he tried to curse us. So we have three different locations. What is the meaning of what's going on here? Source number 10. You who are looking at this week's parsha. Sana enecha lift up your eyes and see. Hashinuyim shematinu b'shlosham akomot. Pay attention, dear listener. He says to the changes of these three locations. Kimitchilane mavayar misham ketzeha am at the beginning. He's looking at the edge of the people, the outskirts. Vachakach neman. The second time it says efes. However, ketzeu tirei v'chulolot tirei. You'll see the edges, but you won't see all of it. Michlal, which infers, as we said, that the first time round, from the edges, he saw all of it. That by looking at the edges, he was able to understand everything in the middle. Our attempt number three was, he saw us dwelling according to our tribes, meaning he really saw all of us. Let's understand. This is what's going on in this week's parasha. Who as follows? Kimitchila originally, Hitzit Bilam Bishorsham Shal Yisrael. Bilam's first attempt to curse us was by looking at our national roots. Where do we come from? The Hainu Mekoram, meaning our source, Vitsur Chotzvam, and the rock from which we have been hewn. Im Yimtza Ba'avon, he says, all right, I've got a project. You brought me this Am Yisrael. You sit in Bilam's office. He says, you want me to curse them? Well, let's look at their history. Let's try and find that there's something I can pick up on in their background check, which will be a vulnerability for them, which will allow me to curse them. So he looks at the history of Am Yisrael, and he tries to find something in our background. Asher al chol haklala, that through this, the curse would then impact and fall gamla anafim on the branches as well. Kibabitul hashoresh, if you can get rid of the source, the root, yiplu gamla anafim, all the branches will fall. You know, it, it makes, it makes um, Bilam coming to curse us sound like, you know, somebody trying to deal with some kind of, uh, I don't know, like trying to treat an infestation with pesticide, just trying to find the nester, then everything else will be sorted out. He says, if I can find the root of this nation and kill them at the root, everything else will fall apart. This is an image of looking at the edge of something or one end of something, which as a result includes everything, because the previous generations include the future generations. So attempt number one to curse us, is to curse us based on our background and our history. And you're looking at one edge, but it's an edge where if you can cut off that edge, snip it in the bud, everything else falls apart. After that failed attempt, that was attempt number one. He needed to start looking at the branches themselves. Maybe he'll find some iniquity in the future generations. So now he's looking at an edge, he's looking at one side of the story, which doesn't encompass everything. Because you can look at something in the children, which is perhaps the other end of the story of the Jewish people, look at them now, but that doesn't include the forefathers. We'll explain all of this soon, a bit better. Plan A was to find something wrong with our background, he failed. Plan B was to find something wrong with us. He failed. What's plan C? Amai says, now, kulam They're all perfect. I can't find a vulnerability where I can take advantage of this vulnerability to curse them. In Cain, therefore, option number three, plan three, achnis behem ayin hara. I'll try and get them with ayin hara. Hasholet biyoter bedavar hashalemi koltzad. Ayin hara is the... Uh, is particularly powerful when you have something which is completely perfect. She'ein bop solet kral, which has nothing lacking at all. That's where the ayin hara is really powerful. He says, based on this structure, we can now explain the three locations 
and everything which takes place there. So we have three attempts to curse Ben Israel. Attempt number one is to curse us based on the vulnerability of our family history. Attempt number two is based on our own behavior now. And attempt number three is to try and get us with the iron hara. So he says as follows. In attempt number one, Balak takes Bilam up to a place called Bamot Baal, or the Bamot, the, uh, oh, what's the English word for Bamot? You know, the, high, the raised places where you offer sacrifices. And he looked at the edge of the people. This is attempt number one. This is an expression, a description of the first search. That he's looking at the root of the whole nation. And he will look and find. He says, aha, I know I'm going to get them. These people used to be idolaters. As it says in Yeshua, and we know this from Seder night. Your forefathers sat on the other side of the river. Meolam, that's where they were dwelling. Terach, Avi Avraham, Avi Nachor. Terach was the father of Abraham and the father of Nachor. And they served other gods. So, and in attempt number one, what happens is that Bilam says, let me try and curse them from the fact that they come from idolaters. Dahainu, which is Bamot Baal. These are the Bamot of Baal. Because we went after Baal. So Balak says to Bilam, let's go after them because they come from idolaters. Umisham, and from that vantage point, vantage point, sorry for sounding like something else. He views the extremity of the people or one side of the people, which is the Shoresh, which is one side. The Hukakulodami, which is like the whole nation. Because all the next generations branch out from the roots. When the root is deserving of curse, that will also impact the branches. Avodazara is a sin which has an impact on future generations. So Balak isn't stupid, neither is Bilam. They want to curse Am Yisrael. And what do they do? They said, we've got some dirt on them. These people come from idolaters. And we know that the sin of idolatry is a sin where future generations pay the price for former generations. However, and now we see in the next paragraph, and then along comes a prophecy to Bilam. Ki balak u bilam naflushnehem bata utgadol that actually both of them made a big mistake. Why? What was their mistake with attempt number one? And this sounds like a midrash, but this is all in the text. If you look at the wording of this week's parasha and the wording of the brachot, he shows that this all emerges from the text. Kirosh yichus uma eina min aram. That the, our family tree does not start in aram. Ki terach hayachashuv kemet b'chayav. In terach's lifetime, he was considered to be already dead. Abraham didn't even have to respect his father because that relationship was completely severed in every single way. We are not the people of Terach. Abraham was a completely new beginning. Our beginning is from Rosh Surim Ze Abraham, which is a reference to Abraham. So, they try to get us based on our background, and we said, sorry, that's not where we come from. We come from Avraham. Don't look at what happened before Avraham. And that's why it says in the parasha, he raised his parable and he said, Balak is leading me from Aram. These are the words of the parasha. Balak, Bilam says, is trying to take me back to Aram, meaning back to the original history of this nation, because he wants to make it look as if we're the people who come from Terach, who lived in Aram, these are the next words in the parasha from the head of the previous part, prior mountains, taking us back to Terach, who came from Abraham, so he wants to take us back to Aram. He wants to take us back to the mountains of Kedem of Yor. 
That's what it means. He wants to show that we are idolaters. Therefore, because he requested Lacha Arali Yaakov, go and curse Yaakov for me. And it's the word Yaakov. And then we will have, we will, he will find our Yaakov, our Achilles heel, without mentioning Achilles. That bracha will then have an impact on those of us who are low down like a hill. And therefore, the anger will be able to spread across Israel. That's how there's going to be anger and rage. Even on the good ones, when we see the loss of where we come from. Let's have a look at all of this in the Psukim, because we've been talking in the air. Let's come back into the Psukim and see how the Kliyakar's explanation is what it says in the Psukim in this week's Pasha. Source number 11. So, this is what actually comes out of Bilam's math. And he says, Minaram Yancheni Valak. Balak is leading me from Aram. Balak Melech Moab. He's leading me from, Mo- from Aram, which we understand to mean a reference to Aram Narayim, to Terach. Meharare Kedem. He wants to take me back to that place. And he says, Lecha Arali Yaakov. Go and curse Yaakov, meaning their weakness from that point. And as a result, Yisrael. And that's why the rage will be spreading across all the good ones as well. He's found the weak point through which he can attack all of us. However, he goes on to say, however, Ma'ekov kel. What can I curse that Hashem hasn't cursed? Or my is on Lozam Hashem. How can I be angry in a place where Hashem wasn't angry? Why? Kimei Rosh Tzurim Erenu. I can't look at him from Aram. And I can't look at him from Harare Kedem. I can't go back that far. I can only look at him from Rosh Tzurim, which is a reference to Avraham. Or and I can peer at him from the hills. There is a nation that dwells alone, meaning they have their own account, and you can't consider them amongst the other nations. That's what's going on in attempt number one. And we're not going to see every attempt, and we're not going to see every detail, but it's along these lines that the Kliakar explains all three attempts. And we're just going to have a little taste of the next two attempts. Because what happens in the next attempt in source number 12? who states of him, he says, all right, I wasn't able to curse them based on Terach. Let's try now a new angle. So he took him to stay Tzofim, which is, uh, means the field of where you could scout from. Seeing as his root therapy treatment of trying to get us all the way back from the other Zara failed, he says, all right, I'm going to have to look at the branches themselves. Let's try and get them from Cheta Egel. These are the people who bow down to the Egel. Surely that should give us potential to curse them. And that's in that context, it says, we're going to look at a place where we can see one end. We don't see the bigger picture. Why? Because we're not looking at their whole history. We're only looking at one end, which is the present. Because it doesn't include previous generations. The people involved in the Egel Azahav were only the outliers of the nation. Levi weren't included. So it's not as good as getting them at their root, but that failed. So he says, you know what? Let's try and get them at the edge. Let's try and get them at something which impacts one side of their history or one side of the nation. It's the age, it's not the whole picture, but what can you do? We're ready in plan B. Vamarani says, Ashetir enu misham, you will see them from there. What does it mean you'll be able to see them from there? Egel naasu megulim. As a result of the Egel, we became exposed. Seeing us means seeing us in our vulnerability. We became exposed as a result of the Egel Azahav. Commotion, Emar, as it says in Shmot, Vayar Moshe etaam ki paruahu. Moshe saw us that we were wild, but what does parua mean? Pirish Rashi, Rashi explains that that word means megula. It suggests a certain nakedness, a certain vulnerability, which, which came along as a result of the sin of the Egel Azahav. 
וראו כל העמים כי שם השם שם מעליהם, because everyone thought that Hashem's name was removed from us. We've lost our divine cloak, our clothing. We've become vulnerable. על ידי העגל, as a result of the egal, וזהו state צופים. Let's go to the place where we could see them. שהולשון הבטא, צופים, means scouts, meaning a place where you can have a look, where you can scout them at, where you can see them. So attempt number two is to try and curse us based on Egel as a Hav, but that too was going to fail. Along comes the response and it says, no, 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 you're mistaken once again. What's the response in the Pesukim? It's ki lo hibit aven bi Yaakov. There is no iniquity amongst Yaakov. That's a quote from the Pasuk, just adding the word zet. But there's no sin in Yaakov. That's not a Jewish problem. Why not? Ki im ha-erev rav levado haya mekoi la masayahu. That came from the erev rav. It's not a vulnerability of us. You're looking at us and you think you found something wrong with us. No, 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 no. There's a group which happened to join us, where they instigated and led and caused us all those problems, but it's not an inherently Jewish problem. That's not a problem for us. And I've missed out what he goes on to do, but he really goes through the psukim of that bracha, describing how phrase by phrase that bracha, meaning that intended curse, was an attempted curse about Egel Azahav, and the response is, no, 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 they haven't done anything wrong with Egel Azahav, you cannot blame them for that. So we've had two attempts so far to curse us. Attempt number one was to look at an edge which was all-encompassing, meaning looking at our source, where the source includes everything that comes after that, which is the fact that we come from Terach, that was a failure, because the response is we come from Avram, we don't come from Terach. Attempt number two was all right, we'll look at an edge which isn't all encompassing, which is Egel Azahav. And they're told, no, that's not going to work because Egel Azahav wasn't an inherent problem of Am Yisrael. It was led by the Erev Rav. He says, you know what? I'm now going to have to go for plan C, which we see in source 13. Plan C. Vayikach Balak et Bilam, Balak took Bilam. Rosh Hapa'or. This is the third destination to Rosh Hapa'or. They're going for plan C. They said, you know, we can't get them. Not with their roots. Nor in their branches either. These guys are just perfect. How can you attack perfect people? Attack to their perfection. Anything which is completely perfect, if something is completely perfect, that is where the Ayin Hara is able to take control. Why? When it's that perfect, because the friend blesses them with such a big voice, and praises him so much, with such a loud voice, when everybody, it's a bit like an, an international tall poppy syndrome. When you are so perfect and so pure and so successful and everyone says how amazing you are, well, how, what are people going to do? The nations are going to hear, and they'll become jealous of them. And they'll place the iron hara on them. And as a result, it will be considered to be a curse for us. He takes them up to attempt number three. He praises us with a loud voice. What the Kliyakar is suggesting here is interesting. What it means is that attempt number three to curse us was not an attempt to curse us. At this point, Balak and Bilam understand that they can't curse us. So they say, you know what? If we can only bless them, we're going to give them one huge blessing. They actually tried to bless us a third time around. They tried to sing our praises because they realized that's all they can do. And all that's left for them in their arsenal, at this stage in the parasha at least, is to attack us with their love and to attack us with, our, with their praises and to go matovu alecha Yaakov and all those other beautiful things. If, I don't know if that's what they intended to say or not, but that's what came out. But at this stage, they're trying to praise us to raise our stock to make us vulnerable to the Ayin Hara. But they failed, as we know, in source number 14. 
Va'amar, and they said as part of the third bracha, Matovu Alecha Yaakov, wow, you're just amazing. Ra'a, what did he see? This is a classic explanation that uh, what do they see in the tents of Yaakov? They looked down at our camp and they saw that no two homes had entrances facing each other. No one was able to look into their neighbor's tent. And therefore, as a result, they said, oh no, look at these people are just too perfect. Look at the way their tents are set up. They've set up their tents in a way that they won't be able to have ayin hara for each other because they're not able to gaze at each other. Amari says, How can they be vulnerable to the ayin hara? Look how careful they are about not putting the ayin hara on each other. They are spread out like rivers. What are rivers? What have rivers got to do with Ayan Hara? Yomash Oale Yaakov Mishkanotav. What it means is that the tents and the dwelling places of Yaakov, Nimshalu Lenachalim, were compared to rivers, Hamechasimet Hadagim, which cover up the fish. Because as we know, and if you don't know, then now you know, Levaltishlot Behem Ayan Hara, Ayan Hara doesn't impact on fish. Um, that's part of the bracha of the Yidgul Aravid. He didn't make this up here. It's a common concept that Ayan Hara cannot impact fish. So he says, oh no, these tents are like rivers, meaning these tents are protecting us from Ayan Hara. We're sitting and learning Torah in these tents. Mitzilin mina Ayan. Attempt number three fails as well. They can't even get us with their compliments. They can't even get us with Ayan Hara because how can you attack a nation which is so particular about Ayan Hara with the Ayan Hara? We are not vulnerable in that way. And I didn't bring you everything that Kliakar says on this week's Prasha. I've given you the overall structure. And if you look at the Kliakar's commentary in the Prasha, he really takes it pasuk by pasuk, phrase by phrase, explaining how these phrases fit in with what he's saying. And he makes a very convincing argument here. Now, I haven't defined Ayan Hara today. There are some of our attendees at our Shi'ur today who are more comfortable with the concept of Ayan Hara than others. But he really does put forward a, a convincing case. They make three attempts to attack us. They try and attack us based on our roots and they fail, based on our Egel Azav and they fail. They try and attack us with the Ayan Hara and they fail. And it appears that they fail. I'll just finish off by saying that according to the Gemara, what happens at the end of their parasha was their uh, was their idea, and they succeeded actually, because what happens at the end of the para, at uh, the end of the parsha, where we sinned, um, if that was their initiative, they actually did find a way to attack us, and that's your homework to look at the end of this week's parsha to see our involvement in this week's parsha and to understand how ultimately, despite Hashem's incredible protection, um, we ourselves are still vulnerable if we don't use our free will in the correct way and if we don't behave properly ourselves. That's it for this morning. Bit of Kliakar and Chukat and Balak. I'm going away for a few days, so I'm not giving the Shi'ur tomorrow. For those who usually attend the Tuesday lunchtime Shi'ur, um, I'm not going to be giving that Shi'ur tomorrow afternoon, but I am back in time for the Thursday Parasha Shi'ur. So uh, no Shi'ur tomorrow, but back for Thursday. Have a wonderful week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.